morning, everybody. Welcome to Memorial United Methodist Church on this World Communion Sunday. We are so glad that you are here. As we get going today, there are a couple of things that really help us all. The first, I remind you, is to let us know that you're worshipping with us. You can do that by going to mumconline.com slash here and filling out our digital attendance pad. Also, a great way that you can participate in worship this morning is by upping your chatter in the comments feed right there. Greet one another, say hello, um, pass on the peace of Christ and share your prayer requests in there. That is the best way to build digital community in this worship service. So we encourage you to go ahead and do that. Today, as well as being World Communion Sunday, is also the beginning of a brand new series entitled what makes you come alive. This is our stewardship season and over the next four weeks we will be talking about how giving and generosity is and can be that which makes us come alive. Stay tuned and I'll be talking more about that later. Pastor Rachel. I invite you now to get a candle if you have one and a way to light it. And we remember today on World Communion Sunday that Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And so as we light this candle in our space, we know that Jesus is in this space and throughout the world in every space. And so as we partake in communion, we are reminded of the people throughout the world who are also taking communion together today. And we know that where the love of Christ is, there also the peace of Christ is. And so we say the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you.
you join me as we affirm our faith together? The words will be on your screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hi, everybody. Today's scripture is coming from 2 Corinthians. And in this scripture verse, it's going to be talking to us all about giving and sharing. Let me give you a little story. If you have one seed and you plant that one seed, you get a flower. But if you have lots of seeds and you plant them, then you get a garden. Sharing and giving can kind of be the same way. Let's say that you have a bag of candy and you don't share it. You don't give any away. You keep it. You have that bag of candy, but when it's gone, it's gone. But if you decide to share some of your candy and you give it out to your family or your friends, you get to share in the joy of having that yummy candy, which can be fun and also can make great memories. Sharing and giving is a great way to show God's love. You don't just have to give things. You don't just have to share items or objects. You can share your time. You can also share things that you're good at. You might be talented at certain things and you can share that with others. And that also can bring them joy. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for the Bible. Help us to share joyfully. It's in your son's name that we pray, amen. And now we want to find out how we can live out our calling memorial with just three things. Remember how I said that the date for our next hands-on mission with Habitat for Humanity was tentative? Well, it is tentative no more. You can put this date on your calendar in pen. Join us this coming Saturday, October 12th at 9 a.m. to help with the latest Habitat for Humanity build. The house is located at 811 South 11th Street in Fernandina. That's just three blocks east of 8th Street between Hickory and Indigo Streets. Wear your red love shows up shirt and closed toed shoes and bring your work gloves to the site and help finish this Habitat house for a local family. Remember, everyone ages 16 and up can help with the Habitat build. So come and make a real difference by helping love show up with Habitat for Humanity this coming Saturday, October 12th from 9 a.m. to noon. Now, you may have seen Pastor Rachel and Pastor Charlie in this week's midweek reflection. Where they're telling us about the urgent call for aid that they've been getting for those affected by Hurricane Helene, both here in Florida and throughout the Southeast. Well, our Florida conference has asked us all to help however we can, and there are a few ways that we can do that. First, you can donate to the conference's Hurricane Relief Fund, which you can find the link to at the top of the page at mumconline.com slash storm. Now, the Florida Conference has also asked churches to provide flood buckets because the supply has run so low. So we're going to do just that. We're going to make flood buckets next week. And because this is an urgent call for buckets, our missions committee has allocated some emergency funds from the General Missions Fund to purchase the needed supplies for these buckets so they'll be here for us. There are two ways that you can help make a tangible difference for those affected by Hurricane Helene through flood buckets. First, join us next Sunday, October 13th, after the 9.30 a.m. service, so around 10.30, in Maxwell Hall. We'll be assembling all those supplies into flood buckets. And if you are coming to the 11 a.m. service, come by before and assemble a flood bucket before you go to worship. 
Now, the other way that you can help is by giving a donation to the General Missions Fund to help us cover the cost of the flood buckets. These flood buckets each cost $75, and our missions committee has allocated funds to make 100 of them. You can give by selecting General Missions Fund at mumconline.com slash give or through the Vanco app. You can also write a check to Memorial with General Missions Fund in the memo, or you can use the donation dip jars out in worship today. Each jar is set to give the gift of $75, which covers one bucket. So that's one bucket per swipe of your debit or credit card. Friends, we all want to do something that makes a real difference for the people hurt by this hurricane because we we know what it feels like to go through a storm, or we can only imagine what it feels like to lose our home, our livelihood, and our community in the blink of an eye. And we're a denomination that's built on connection. So let's use that connection to help UMCOR and our conference disaster recovery mission to help our friends repair their homes and rebuild their lives in this time of need. If you missed any of those ways that you can help or give, visit mumconline.com slash storm to find out more. Now, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. Now, I'd ask the pastors to cover their ears, but they already know it. It's not a secret. So this is a great time for us to let our wonderful pastors know how important they are to us and how much we appreciate them. So why not tie that in with something else we love to do, which is gather together for a meal? Sounds good to me. So let's make our next good old-fashioned church potluck on October 20th, our Pastor Appreciation Potluck. You know the drill. Memorial provides the main meat, and you provide the veggies, sides, and desserts. The amount of yummy food we have is only limited by the amount of yummy food you bring. And if you'd like to bring a little card or gift for the pastors, there'll be baskets out there to collect for those, too. So let's celebrate Charlie, Rachel, and Alice on Sunday, October 20th. We'll begin the food line as soon as the 11 a.m. service wraps up. So sometime after 12 noon, bring a dish to share and we'll see you there. Helping a local family realize the dream of home ownership through the Habitat Build. Assembling flood buckets to send help and love to our neighbors affected by Hurricane Helene. And taking a moment to celebrate our pastors with good food and fellowship. These are just three things that you can do to live your calling through Memorial. Because of your generous gifts to Memorial, our people, our ministries, and our missions continue to do God's work in our community and in the world. At the website shown on the screen, you can find out more about the many ways you can give to and through Memorial. Thank you for your continued commitment to God's work through our church. Please pray with me. Father God, we are humbled by all of the gifts you have given us but we are aware that there are so many needs in this world. We ask that you continue to place in front of us opportunities to use our hands, our feet, our mouths, our hearts, and our financial resources to do your will and only your will in this world. It's through your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now will you go into a time of prayer with me. God, we come to you this morning with so much weighing on our hearts. We know that there is far more grief, heartbreak, and fear right now than any of one of us can bear. Hear our prayers as we cry out on behalf of our siblings throughout the world who need relief. Lord, for the people in Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, South, and North Carolina who are mourning the loss of their homes, belongings, and livelihoods, we pray that people will come in your name offering hope and love to help put back the pieces of their life. For those who have not yet been reached, who are missing, and who are in desperate need of supplies, we pray that recovery and help is swift. We lift up the rescue teams who are making the often treacherous journey to reach the most remote of places. Guide their paths that they may reach their destinations without harm. Strengthen their resolve, for we know that what they may encounter on the way will carry with them for the rest of their lives. God, we give thanks to you that you are with us in the storm. 
For those who have lost loved ones, we ask that they know your presence now and always. We grieve the loss of life and know that our grief reaches you. Shelter those who are unsure how to go on. We pray for the first responders, the helpers, the linemen and women, the volunteers and those making donations, and the animals. The network of people and creatures who are working tirelessly to bring aid to these communities. Continue to strengthen the bonds of our people throughout the nation. God, you call us to love our neighbor, and this is a time where that call is urgent and loud, and there is a response taking place. And as these responders are in action, may those who don't yet know you come to know of your love. Lord, at the same time that our country is experiencing this collective grief, we pray for countries around the world who are embroiled in bitter struggles of war, violence, and famine. We earnestly pray for peace in the Middle East and Europe. We pray that solutions are found that do not result in more bombs and more destruction. Lord, we ask that the fighting stops because we know that this is not your way. And God, for all those experiencing their own grief, sadness, loneliness, and darkness in our own community, we pray that your light shines into that darkness. Fill their hearts with hope and let us walk alongside them as lights ourselves. May we continue to follow in the way of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. Hear the word of God. The point is this. The one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hi there, everybody. I'm here with, uh, with my friends and our church members here, Rick and Mary Smither. And, uh, and they're going to help us, as a few other people will be over the coming weeks, with just some story and some testimony um, that really ties into uh, the big question of this series that we're working through. I just want to start with that first question. Uh, Rick and Mary, what, what makes you come alive? Well, Charlie, you know what? I love life. I really do. I'm a nine and a half year breast cancer survivor. And so every day I get up and say, what's coming? I really do. And um, with that, what makes me come alive is to see other people happy and joyful. And there's a scripture, I think it's in Luke, but I'm not sure, but something about to those who've been given much, much is required. And so one way I try to come alive is to help other people. That makes me feel more alive. Thank you. Rick, what about you? I, I like to see people having a good time, having fun together, uh, friends and family get together, whether it's at the beach, whether it's at uh, you know, an amusement park or anywhere, you know, just, just seeing people having a good time. And I like to do that also. All right. So let's, uh, let's just take that question a little bit further. Uh, you're both people of the Christian faith. Um, how, how does that play out in your life as a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, I believe that your faith has to be actionable. I believe that you can't just talk it or, or talk about it. You've got to do it. So, you know, as a librarian for 35 years in the school system, and being a librarian is different than being a teacher, an administrator. 
you're kind of that in-between person. You're that grandma. You get to encourage people. I don't think I ever said the words, I'm a Christian, but they knew it mm. because they could see it in how I encouraged them. And many times they'd come in and say, you know, I've got this problem. Could you pray with me? Even the students. And if they asked, I could do it. I'd say, come on, any friends need prayers for this test? And we'd come in. And I would never pray that they pass the test. I would pray that they would that they knew the material, but that, that they could be calm and confident and just whiz through it. And you know what? Many, many times they came back and thanked me. So. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, like I said, the, uh, I like seeing people coming together and having a good time. And, you know, the community of church does that. Uh, every Sunday we come together to reinforce our faith, faith in uh in Jesus and plus we get to be around people that are thinking the same way are like-minded and uh, then you get a chance to fellowship with them also so it all comes together and uh, you know just that coming together Sunday is uh, just a wonderful way to uh, show our uh, our values there. right so what I'm hearing is fellowship connection yeah. worship these kind of things make us come alive in our Christian faith, right? Yes, it does. Let me uh, push a little bit further, and we're in a stewardship series, and and so what is what does stewardship mean as you respond to and think about that question? What makes you come alive? Well, I grew up in a family of eight kids, and my mom and dad. My dad worked at Sears. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, so we never had much, but we didn't know we didn't because. They were so ingrained in that, our church that we always had Jesus with us. And we believe, Rick and I don't have much and probably never will be, but you know what? Everything we have is multiplied because of what we've been able to give. And you said it Sunday, and so did Sarah when she kept, kept saying, you get to do these things. What a blessing, you've got Christ, so you get to do these things and you want to do these things. And then where you brought up all the different ways you can help, Yes, giving is important because that makes everything work. But if you don't have those resources, you know, you could drop a, a box of pasta in the, in mm -hmm. the box. Mm -hmm. You can help, as you said, work in the office or read the scripture. This church, more than any church I've ever been in, has 150,000 ways every week to help, that everybody has a chance to get involved and, and to be part of it. So. Giving back is, monetary is important because nothing works without that, yeah. but if you can't do that, there's so many ways right. to be an encourager and to be involved. Yeah. You know, when we were raising our family, uh, you know, time, times money got tight mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we couldn't always give our full 10% tithe mm -hmm. to the church. Uh, we tried to offset that by giving our time mm -hmm. during that time, and, but sometimes, you know, when you're raising a family, that doesn't always happen right. either because you got those responsibilities. So, uh, so we did the best we could. Uh, now that we're retired, uh, things are much easier. And I guess we're kind of making up for lost time or something. <laughs> I don't know which, but, but anyway, uh, we have more freedom to give uh, generously and even above generously sometimes. And then we have uh, more time to give ourselves. And the, the, the best thing is, after whether you give your money or you give your time, for service or something, when you see the recipient of that uh, service or, t or money that you're given, you see that smile on their face, mm -hmm. makes it all work. Right. Yeah. Just, yeah, right. just like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a powerful thing. I think uh, one of the, the phrases that sticks out for me, Mary, is what, what you said. Um, I think it was something around what we have is multiplied by what we give. Um, and that, I think that applies to generosity across the board. Um, Rick, Mary, I would love to take much more time, but I've got a sermon to preach on the other side of this. So, um, so I'm going to bring this to a close and just say thank you, thank you, thank you both for all that you give and time and talent and, and uh, from your treasure as well. Thank you, thank you for all of it. Thank you. Thank you so much to Rick and Mary for taking the time to chat with me this week. You know, it, it takes a lot to sit in front of a camera and to share a part of your story or a part of your heart. I'm just grateful for them, for all that they bring to our life together here at Memorial. And I hope that what they have shared with us in this way is already starting the work of the Holy Spirit's inspiration in your heart and in mine this morning. 
Each week in this new series, we are going to be hearing from a number of different voices, hearing responses to that question, the title of our series, What Makes You Come Alive? Hearing stories of impact that will show us how generosity not only makes us come alive when we extend it to others, but actually gives life to others in so many ways too. This is the beginning of our annual stewardship series. And for as long as I can remember in my ministry, I have started the first sermon of a stewardship series in exactly the same way, saying words like these. We are at the beginning of a series on stewardship. And over the coming weeks, you're going to hear me talking a lot about money. So let's get this out of the way. I don't like it and you don't like it, but we have to do it anyway. So let's grit our teeth, get on with it, and know that it will all be over soon. (laughs) You know, whenever I first started saying things like that, I meant every single word. I knew that no one really likes to hear the preacher preach about their money and what God calls them to do with it. And I knew that I didn't like preaching about people's money and what God was calling us to do with our funds. I found it uncomfortable. I I was not confident in it. I I felt under-equipped, and I really did not believe that anyone would ever respond positively to anything I had to say about stewardship. Then in 2015, the annual conference put on a stewardship training uh, for a number of clergy, and I got to be one of them. I learned a lot in those three days apart, and what I learned changed the way I thought about faith and finances changed it for me as an individual follower of Jesus Christ, changed it for me as a pastor and leader. And it changed the way that I would preach about money thereafter. I guess I felt more equipped, but I still didn't like it because I still knew that no one really likes to hear the preacher preach about money. And deep down, I probably still didn't expect anyone to respond positively to what I might say about the topic. Well, since then, I've continued to learn a lot especially since moving here to minister among you in Fernandina Beach. But most years, I I still say those very same things that I've been saying all along. Only more recently, I'm saying them more as as a bit of an icebreaker. Something to make us all laugh a little, to put us all at ease, because I still know that while I'm no longer as scared as I once was to preach about Christian stewardship, I'm still pretty sure that that most of you don't like to hear the preacher preach about money, right? (laughs) So how will I start this series this year? Hmm. Let me try this. Friends, we are at the beginning of a series on Christian stewardship. And over the coming weeks, you are going to hear myself and Pastor Rachel talk about the gifts that we all possess in life. The gifts of time, the gifts of our talents, and yes, also the gift of our financial resources too you're going to hear about the impact that we can collectively have in our community and world when we follow the example of Jesus, when we willingly give of ourselves, willingly give out of our abundance, give in all of the ways that we can to join in with God's kingdom work in the world. You know, I used to be afraid of this series of sermons each year. They always made me nervous because... I know that people don't love to hear the preacher preach about money, right? But I have my own testimony now. In recent years, I've done some growing and I've done a lot of learning. And friends, I have discovered that in my faith journey, hand on heart, I can say nothing makes me come alive more than joining in with God's work in the world through my giving and generosity. Now, what on earth could account for that change? Well, the best response to that question is for me to tell you that the why behind my giving has changed. When I think back to those earlier years, whenever I found this topic so difficult, I reflect that my own reasons for giving were numerous, but were very, very different from the reason and testimony that I can give now. What were some of those reasons? Well, first of all, first of all, I, I gave out of obligation. 
Because it's what we do, Christians, right? It's what I watched my dad do. It's what he taught me to do. Son, you belong to a church. You're part of a faith family that has needs and in which everybody has to play their part, big or small. So put your hand in your pocket and give them something. The other reasons that I give, I, I, I give maybe from a, a theological thought of, of a transaction with God. Thinking that if I do this, if, if I give, God will do something else for me. I know, right? How naive was I to think that I could ever have that kind of power over the actions that God would or would not take? Third, I, I was giving in order to build maybe my own sense of assurance. Well, if I'm giving, then I'm a good Christian. And if I'm a good Christian, I'm going to make it to the finish line of life. God will welcome me with open arms. Again, thorough naivety to think that my actions could ever create in me some lasting sense of assurance. I also gave out of habit. I mean, it's what we do. It's what I did every week. And I didn't even think about it any more. Now, the habit development was good. It was good to, to develop that habit of giving and generosity, but not thinking about it on a regular basis, not being attentive to what I was giving or where God was calling me and how God was calling me to give, not doing that over the long haul, that was not so good. And then I also gave out of this sense of obedience. As I engaged scripture more and more, I learned that giving and generosity is simply a part of the life of faith part of answering the call to obediently follow in the way of Jesus is answering the call to give and to live generously. Perhaps you can relate to some of those reasons. And all of them are perfectly reasonable reasons to engage in giving. But in this series of sermons, I really want us to move beyond these kinds of reasons and get to the bigger question around generosity and giving, which is this. What if our giving and generosity in the life of the church became more than an obligation, more than a habit, more than a bargaining tool with God? What if giving and generosity became our joy? What if generosity became that which makes us come alive. Now, I think this is the kind of question that is behind the words that we just read in 2 Corinthians. Chapters 8 and 9 of this letter are a kind of standalone section right in the middle of it all. Some scholars even believe that, that these words might have been lifted from another source, from another fragment, uh, and placed into the middle of this letter by a scribe or interpreter somewhere along the way, because there are no context clues leading up to it or anything about it afterwards. It's just kind of there, in the middle of everything else in this letter, this section that is focused on the subject of generosity. And it points to this notion of faithful, obedient giving being something that has been carried over from the ancient Jewish tradition into the Christian faith. And it's now an expectation in the lives of the followers of Jesus who make up the early church. The commentator Ernie Best says it like this. He says, organized giving of money was a well-recognized Jewish practice. Collections were made for the upkeep of the temple and its services. Voluntary giving to the poor was widely stressed as a virtue in Judaism. And in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, we see that Christians had already accepted the practice. It is very clear in this passage that the writer wants the readers to engage in an act of generous giving. There is a need for their giving. The Jerusalem Christians have a need and the wider network of small Christian churches all around the region are being encouraged to give towards that need. So in the same way as I am currently inviting you to support the work of our sister churches in areas that have experienced storm damage and devastation, the writer of this letter is inviting Corinthian Christians to support the work of Jerusalem Christians among the poor in their community. He is giving them a solid why. There's a need. But the why moves beyond the physical need. 
In the verses that immediately follow the section that we read, the writer states that the readers will be enriched in every way for their great generosity. And that their generosity will produce thanksgiving to God. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. And there it is. There's the deeper why behind Christian giving and generosity. Friends, giving and generosity has to be about more than simply meeting a need. In the local church here at Memorial, our giving has to be about more than keeping on the lights and maintaining a campus, as important as both of those things are, believe me. (laughs) But in the heart of the Christian, the practice of generosity must also be about giving glory to God and generating thanksgiving for God's goodness in the world. We give to meet needs, but going even deeper than that, we give because we want others to experience the goodness and the grace of God. Amen? We give because we long to see others taste and see that the Lord is good. We want others to experience the life of God in this world for themselves. We heard that in the words that Rick and Mary spoke to us in our opening video. They have found and experienced joy in God's life shared with them. And they want others to do the same. And so they share themselves with the world through our life together here at Memorial. Through the giving of their time, their treasure and their talents. My deepest desire for all of us in this series of sermons is not singularly that we will each make a pledge to the General Operating Fund, although I do hope we all will. No. My deepest desire is that this series of sermons will help us all to discover that giving and generosity is not just another part of what it is to be an obedient Christian, but that giving brings life and can be what makes us come alive in God. I know that that has been my own learning and experience in recent years as my understanding of generosity and giving as a Christian practice has unfolded. I think that that has been the experience of our friends Rick and Mary Smither too. And my question to you all this morning is this. Is it your experience also? Is your giving and generosity in whatever forms they take in your life, is it that what makes you come alive? I contend that it can be. And if that is something that you are hungry to experience, having heard these few words, I invite you to let this moment be the beginning of a season of prayer in which you would ask God to guide you towards a deeper generosity, one that gives you joy, one that helps generate the life of God around us in the world, a generosity which makes you come alive. There will be plenty of times in the weeks ahead for me to invite you to make pledges, for me to talk about the needs of this church and this community. But right from the get-go, friends, I'm inviting you to develop a new relationship with giving and generosity, to let it be that which makes you come alive. After all, that's the example of Christ. In his giving and generosity and the sacrificial nature of it all, he has given us new life. We remember that every time we gather around the Lord's table, remembering that that Jesus has given himself holy so that we might experience new life, so that we might grow this new understanding of giving and generosity, so that it might be that which makes us come alive, resurrected new life within us, offering the life of God to the world around us through our acts of great generosity and giving. We follow in the way of Jesus by doing all of this. We follow in the way of Jesus by remembering that he did give himself, gathering with his friends on the night in which he gave himself up for us. He was with them and he he took some bread and he gave thanks for the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. He said, take Eat. This is my body given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. The scripture tells us that after supper that night, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks for what was in it. And then he shared it out among his friends. He said, take and drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, today we give thanks for these gifts. And we join Jesus at his table and we receive and partake of these gifts. We do this on World Communion Sunday, friends, in which we are reminded that we don't just gather around this table on our own here through Memorial in Fernandina Beach, Florida, but actually we gather with brothers and sisters in the Christian faith all over the world across many, many traditions of the faith in different languages in different kinds of local outfits. and We look different, we sound different, and yet we all gather around this one table. We celebrate one bread, one body broken, one blood shed for all of the earth. And so, with your brothers and sisters across the world today, friends, I hope you have elements at home. And if you have them, take that bread or take that piece of cracker and tear a piece off for yourself and just hold it for a second. Be mindful that you are eating this in remembrance of Christ with your brothers and sisters across the world. Christ who gave himself generously so that we might know new life. This is the body of Christ that was given for you, friends. Take now and eat in remembrance of him. And also take that cup. Hold it for a second. Reminding yourself once again that you're not drinking this alone. You are at a table around which millions of people are gathered today. Sharing in this moment. Sharing in this experience. Brothers and sisters in Christ. Remembering that Christ shed his blood so that we might know forgiveness of sins and newness of life. This is the blood of Christ that was shed for you. Take now and drink in remembrance of him. Let us pray together. Gracious God, we give thanks for the invitation to gather around your table. We give thanks for the new life that you have given us and for the call to live generous, giving lives that invites others to experience this new life too. As we rise up from this table today, may we do so enthused, energized, and inspired to live lives of generosity. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. At the end of all of our sermon moments in our digital service, friends, we always have a few questions just to, to put up on screen to help you reflect on what we've been thinking through today. So here are this week's questions. us to the close of this digital service. We are thankful that you have been able to join us this morning and uh, and we hope and pray that you have begun a stirring in your heart by the power of the Spirit. We remind you that we are back here next Sunday morning. This digital service will go out again at 11 o'clock on our YouTube channel. Or if you're in town here, we always love to welcome all of our friends here at, uh, at our campus in Fernandina Beach. So uh, please plan to join us if you can at one of our three worship services. We have an early one at 8 a.m., second service at 9.30 in Maxwell Hall, and 11 a.m. back here in the sanctuary. Friends, 
I, I hope that we will get to see you soon. We will get to worship together again next week, continuing this series around what it makes, what makes us come alive. In the meantime, receive this benediction. Beloved children of God, would you go in peace today to love and to serve, to give generously and to give freely in a way that gives life to this world, in a way that makes us come alive. Go in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.